welcome to another episode of the Car Wash Advisory Podcast. I am Colin May, Managing Director here at Car Wash Advisory. Uh, with me today is Landon Rohde, who is an analyst here at Car Wash Advisory as well. Uh, thanks for joining Landon on your first podcast. Appreciate it. Yeah, good to be here and do this. Excited for it and uh, ready to get started. All right. Uh, for this episode, we wanted to talk about uh, the sale process of actually selling selling a car wash. Um, uh, pretty much for any car wash owners, um, at some point, pro- probably consider selling, whether that's right now, later this year, or really any time into the future, you know, five years from now. Uh, we still thought it would be uh, very helpful to give you um, pretty much just a really high level introductory overview. Um, of what that typical sale process just looks like. Uh, We're not going to get too in the weeds of everything, but just so uh, an operator can kind of know what to expect uh, when the the time comes to sell um, and so that you're prepared, not really surprised by anything um, that that happens uh, once you do go down that path. Uh, We just want people to be informed kind of once they make that decision. Um, So the steps and I guess timeline that we'll outline here, we will assume that you're hiring a broker. We're a bit biased that way. Um, so we will assume that you're working with a broker or investment banking firm like Car Wash Advisory. But even if you're not um, and you're you know, being approached directly by, by strategic or, or financial buyers and you're really only dealing directly with maybe one or two of them without a broker, most of this will still apply to you. Maybe not kind of the first couple steps, um, but definitely the later steps once you get into offers agreements, diligence, closing, all that stuff pretty much applies to to any seller. Um, So I guess before we jump right into it, um, needless to say, selling your business, your car wash business or any business is a major life decision. Um, So obviously, you know, before you, um, you know, what we're about to talk about all these steps, before you do any of that, you should obviously heavily contemplate that decision um and whether it's the right time for you to sell or not uh so obviously talk to your your family other peers in the industry uh specialists like us um we highly recommend before making the decision to even sell get evaluation uh we do them uh complimentary so before we even sign up a client we do them free of charge um just as a resource for for operators um and there's no no pressure to to sign up and sell now um and really why that is the kind of one of the worst things you can probably do is jump into a sale process process without knowing if the number you might have in your head or the number you need is uh, actually kind of in line with the market. Um, so if you you want or need five million um, and really your wash might only sell for for three and a half or four, you probably want to know that in advance because you might not want to um, sell at that point. It might make sense to wait. Uh, or vice versa, uh, maybe your washes were seven, um, so you don't want to go into it telling people that you'll sell for five. Um, so you just want to be informed. So we highly recommend that as a, kind of a first initial step. Um, we're not going to get into that, whether you should or shouldn't. Um, our colleagues, uh, uh, John Michael Tamburo and Harry Crusoe, actually did an entire podcast on just that topic. So um, check that out, listen or watch that if you haven't already and, and you want to kind of learn about that as well. Um, but I guess once you have decided to sell and, and chosen a broker, maybe not, uh, but before you do anything, I think it's the first step, it's critical to prepare. So that first step is the preparation stage. Um, so mm-hmm. before speaking with any any single buyer, um, it's it's really important to really gather all the key information that, that buyers are, are going to require, uh, they're going to ask you for. Um, so it makes sense to gather all that ahead of time organize it um, so that it's easy for buyers to kind of interact with you and, and understand your business, uh, but also prepare yourself in advance. You know your own numbers, what you're working with, identify maybe some issues, adjustments that have to be made, kind of know know what you're what you're kind of jumping in the process with. And again, so there's no surprises. So <clears throat> Lynn, this is kind of where you uh, really get heavily involved in our processes. Um, so I guess What's an overview of kind of the the, the typical key pieces of, of information that we gather up front um, and what those are and, and how they're used? Yeah, so I'd say even before we start any of the marketing marketing materials or anything, we we gather mainly three or four key things. The first, obviously, financial. So we'll gather the uh, owner's P and L statements made from the last three years or so, and if they're available, we 
We also require to get some tax returns just to kind of dive into that information. And uh, other than that, we get sales reports and car counts. So we run POS systems from the last three years. We get the car counts from that so we can kind of see if there's any but we usually get it monthly so we can kind of determine if there's any various trends, month, monthly trends, kind of see if things have been growing at an incline statement, just kind of various different things. And also, other than just financials and car counts and things like that, we we get photos, so site photos, if it's anything from exterior photos to interior photos of the tunnel, so uh, things like that. And if it's a, if it's a newer wash, we we sometimes will get some projections maybe that's done by another third party company like Sonny's or NCS if that's not available we also have our own way about uh performing those projections on our own so that's through either site demographics car counts capture rate um just other industry margins that we kind of apply to the wash to depict the projection it should I was like an industry standard. So we kind of get those things and run with that before even any of the marketing materials just so we kind of have a general idea of the wash and the, the overview. Yeah, that's perfect. It's actually not that much information. Um, it's, as you said, it's only a few, a few key things, but where some of the work comes in is that we look backwards at least usually two or three years and the monthly, the monthly basis kind of makes you you know, you have to run various reports going back. So it's a lot of, uh, it's a few items, but looking backwards, um, you know, if we are pulling monthly reports, it can be a lot of reports. Um, so it's a little bit of work up front. Um, and, you know, if you're working with a broker, they can help you through that. Everything should be, you know, available to an operator. Um, the sales reports and car counts are always, you know, stored in their their POS system, whether it's DRB, ICS, Sunnies, uh, Micrologix, there's a few others as well. Um, I guess one thing I'll add is if you do have a leased property, a copy of your lease and the lease terms is, is pretty critical as well. Um, Cause someone who's taken over that lease wants to know how long it is and all the key terms. So, um, and yeah, if you're working with us or, or any broker, they'll take all that uh, work with you to get it. And they'll, they'll craft some marketing materials around that, uh, which basically just organizes all that key information into from raw, raw data, raw information, uh, maybe hard to to review and digest into kind of a professional and digestible package uh, for buyers to to review. Um, and again, that's kind of where you spend a lot of time for us, Landon, is uh, the marketing materials and putting those together. Um, what are the kind of the, the couple key documents that create and, and kind of what they're used for and uh, what the, what part of the process? Yeah, so I would say the the two key marketing kind of packages we put together the main one is or the first one we put together is a teaser so that's uh it's a one page concise brief document that's it's completely anonymous so doesn't depict the wash it kind of gives a brief opportunity overview of the site um the state that it's located in maybe some brief financial information like the revenue for the past few years uh ebitda the margins kind of gives you enough information to be interested but not give away any of the concrete details of what the company is what the wash is where it's located so it just kind of brings the the main interest together and that's what we send out initially to a large group of buyers just to see if there's initial interest and then once there is an nda signed and we create a sim and a sim's the the not more important but it's the the larger marketing deck that we create with very very in-depth detail on kind of everything that you would need to make a decision on if you want to pursue this wash or not it's gonna it's gonna include in-depth financial information all the the site details plans some info on management structure um, a bunch of photos and layout of the wash it's also gonna include a competition summary so see kind of the competition around the area and just kind of most of the information that you need before kind of making a decision whether to dive in or not but that's i would say that's the yeah. two kind of key marketing materials that we we make yeah yeah that's exactly it um and then still during this preparation phase um as that all that's going on gathering information creating materials um i can speak for for other brokers or other uh, advisors, but 
um, car wash advisory that will we'll build a very detailed buyer list. Uh, so the people that we're going to go out and contact, um, we build that in advance. Um, we show it to our clients, we give it to them, um, let, let them have a chance to review and, and kind of uh, comment or, you know, adjust it if they really want. Um, but we pull that from from numerous uh, well, a handful of different sources. Um, and again, that's that's where you spend a lot of your time, Landon. So, yeah, where the main the main kind of sources that we're we're building, uh, you know, buyer list from, um, and then you know how what's the typical kind of size you'd say of our our typical our buyer list on a deal? Yeah, so like you said, it's it comes from various different kind of opportunities. I mean, we have a database on our own that we've built out over the last few years, just from people inbound calling saying like, hey, I'm looking for opportunities in XYZ markets, this size opportunity. It can be strategics, people that own car washes um, in the market that were selling a wash it could be PE groups that either own or are looking to own car washes, um, individual buyers, maybe previous real estate investors or high net worth individuals that are looking to get into space. So we kind of have that already pre-built out with, I would say just those in general, kind of depending on market and size and what the deal is, it's anywhere from, I would say 200 to 300 people from that. And then wherever the wash is, we usually do a manual scan of say a hundred mile radius and kind of scan for any washes around the region, look on Google Maps and other resources just for washes that we don't have in our database that we haven't connected with. And then we'll call those and see if there's any interest in being added into the process, if there's any interest in expanding or kind of what they're looking for. So we'll do a lot of manual search as well. And then yep. that's pretty much how we build the, the buyer list. So it's yeah. a mix internal, yeah. what we already have, and then a lot of searching and looking and connecting the dots to what we don't have. Yeah, yeah, we, as you mentioned, yeah, we have a very detailed database. We get contacted almost daily by by buyers, private equity uh, firms, individuals, um, just wanting to see car washes for sale. Um, but we don't pretend like we know every single buyer in the country. Um, so we do have, um, uh, you know, ways to to go out and you know, Landon spends a lot of hours on on Google, kind of manually uh, finding these these buyers because we uh, really don't want to leave any stone unturned. Um, and we don't want to make any assumptions on who the buyer will be um, and just say, oh, it's in this market, this type of wash. Oh, this person's going to be the buyer for sure. Mm -hmm. Actually, in in I'd say at least half, probably more than fifty percent of our our deals, um, a buyer is someone who we didn't know going into it, or someone who you would have never guessed. They kind of come out of nowhere and and show some interest. Um, it's not always the large strategic that's nearby. Um, in fact, as as the markets change, it's it's usually not. It's someone who you would never guess. So we try to cast a wide net. As Landon mentioned a minute ago, um, we don't, uh, when we do blast it out or, or start contacting buyers, um, we don't have, you know, car wash XYZ name on it. Um, it's anonymous, doesn't say the name, doesn't say the address, um, usually it'll just say the state. Um, and if it's a larger package um, where, you know, 10 sites in, uh, you know, whatever state uh, could be obvious to someone, we'll say the region. So Southeast, Northeast, you know, Mid-Atlantic, um, just so it's it's truly anonymous. Um, I guess to sum up that preparation stage, all of that, it's a lot of work. Uh, you know, we, we do most of it, thankfully. Um, it's usually anywhere from two to three weeks um, in totality to kind of prep for, for marketing. Um, but then once you are prepared to hit the market, the next step is the marketing phase. Um, and again, Landon, you spent a lot of time kind of grinding away doing this for us. Um, so once we do, you know, you know, get the thumbs up from our client and kind of click that, that <clears throat> launch button, so to speak, uh, kind of what is that uh, very high level, um, you know, overview of that marketing process? How does that look? From the, the point where decide to start contacting buyers um kind of up until i guess uh, an offer yeah so i guess from the start after we build out the target list obviously the initial launch is that teaser so we'll have the list it's usually in the range from 200 to 500 people on the the target list so we'll shoot out a initial email blast with the teaser just to try to generate any interest and uh, simultaneously while doing that, we're calling through groups that we haven't contacted or haven't heard back from, just trying to just get any 
interest we can. So we'll send that teaser out. Once uh, there's interest shown, NDA is usually signed or is signed. And then we'll, we have the SIM, which has all the in-depth information we'll send out from there. And then, uh, so just nonstop replying, sending, sending SIMs, getting NDAs. And if there's a listing in place, we'll get a lot of inquiries that way. So third-party sites, which we do this on certain instances, it just kind of depends on the wash, but it'll be a completely confidential listing process. So it's kind of like the teaser, but on a, a listing. So it's, you'll never be able to depict what the wash actually is. It's just kind of a way to find those needle in the haystack buyers that we wouldn't find on our own, even calling through thousands and thousands, just yeah. you know, it's just another way to kind of find those people. So we'll, if they come in through a listing, we'll make them sign an NDA, send proof of funds just so we can vet out the buyers so we don't waste the, the seller's time or our time. And we'll send them the SIM that way and just uh, nonstop follow-up calls, answering any kind of inbound questions on various things from the wash. And uh, so just doing that and and it usually, I would say, normal process within four to five weeks of kind of follow-ups, calls, emails, back and forth questions, we can generate an offer or get an LOI. But that's, it depends, but I would say usually in that four to five weeks. Don't you, Kyle? Yeah, yeah, um, that's exactly exactly right. Uh, it takes maybe a little bit longer than some people think, um, and that's just because it takes a long time to actually get in touch with a lot of buyers, um, especially some of the smaller ones, local washes. Um, and, you know, most people, whether it's car wash strategic, you know, the bigger guys, they have a lot on the go. They have their own sites are operating, lots of other acquisition opportunities. They're, they're um, you know, evaluating. So people are busy. Um, there's a lot on the go. And um, even people who are maybe buying the first car wash, they usually have another job or even someone who has one or two car washes, you know, they have a full-time job running their business. And this is kind of what they're doing as a secondary sort of use of their time. So it takes usually a couple of weeks for people to to get through it, ask questions. So yeah, we, we do a lot of following up and yeah. um you know, we'll even call people. people three or four times, no answer, then say week four or five, they'll come and say like, hey, is this still available? I just just now yeah. seeing this, haven't been able to kind of spend the time and look at it. So it just you never know. It's just always random. People are busy and yeah. So it's just, yeah, yeah never mind. Really. Yeah. Um, and assuming, you know, you go through this, the process, um, that marketing phase and, and there are offers, one or more offers, um, they'll usually take the form of a, of an, a letter of intent, an LOI. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the next phase of the, of the sale process. Once you are kind of canvas your buyer market and hopefully you receive an offer or more offers. Um, you get into that LOI offer stage, which can be, um, you know, a, a couple of weeks on its own just to get it in place. Um, what a letter of intent for anyone who doesn't know, it's basically a two to three page document. Um, <clears throat> it'll contain the the main terms of a buyer's offer. Sometimes it is very detailed and gets into, you know, a lot of more legal and secondary terms as well, which is fine. More detail is good, uh, but it'll, it'll contain like the, the key terms um, that a buyer wants to offer and, and move forward with. Um, and this is really just, it's non-binding. So it's not like once it's in place and signed, it's like a done deal. Um, it's really just to ensure the buyer and the seller are on the same page and that there's like a, a common understanding before really moving forward. Because the next step is where you get into a lot of time investment, uh, lawyers involved. So you're spending uh, time and money with lawyers um, and other third party um, service providers and consultants, which we'll probably briefly touch on in a couple of minutes, uh, but before you really commit both sides to spending that time uh, and money to to put the deal in place formally, you want to be on the same page. So that's that's the purpose of a letter of intent. Um, I guess, it, uh, Landon, I can, what are? Yeah, go ahead. Just go over some like bare key terms of an LOI. I mean, yeah. most of you probably know this pretty general. Information, but I mean, it starts with obviously the purchase price. So how much how much the the buyer is willing to pay for the wash. And there's also like terms of the payment. So how how the buyer is either financing through maybe SBA loan if there's any seller financing terms. Maybe it's all cash. So just how the terms of the payment, what's in place. There's also a due diligence period call. So it can be anywhere from 
45 to 60 days just kind of gives time for the the buyer to review all kind of in-depth information on the site the financials title survey environmentals kind of everything through that kind of in-depth level on the site there's also um some clauses like deposit amount, earnest money, that usually kind of comes in place after the diligence period. Say it's a percentage of the purchase price and it's it's usually non-refundable. So it just kind of shows where the buyer puts their best foot forward. They're very interested. So they kind of can't get that money back and then closing calls. So uh, usually 30 days after, after a diligence is in place and there's sometimes an extension in there. It's usually just in there uh, for give time for the buyer to obtain financing and whatnot but uh that and there's there's other specific clauses for different different uh cases such as like non-competes holdbacks just it just depends on but those what i would say are the the bare bones just kind of average loi terms yeah yeah exactly pretty much the price they want to pay, how they want, how they want to pay that price and structure it, whether it's you know this much upfront seller financing, which is becoming more common um, for some newer washes, which have a lot of growth, and you know maybe the seller wants some credit for that growth. Um, there could be an earnout period, so you'll pay this much on closing, and then this much based on how it performs over the next year or two. Um, so how they want to structure it. Um, and then yeah, the, the timeline, how how long they expect it to take from now until until closing, um, and then some holdback and other things that that you mentioned as secondary terms, uh, but still very important. Um, I guess yeah, on the holdback, that's actually one that maybe the most common surprise for a lot of sellers. It's um, basically money that's held back on closing. Um, so a lot of people think, oh, I don't get all all my money on closing. Why are they holding it? Um, but we have other articles and podcasts again that that get into the the specific uh, these specific terms and kind of what to expect in terms of dollar amounts percentages. But it's holdbacks one that's tricky for a lot of sellers to understand. But it's essentially kind of like a short term insurance policy uh, for a buyer. I mean, uh, every buyer's at a disadvantage because a seller knows their business inside and out for as long as they've owned it. Um, whereas a buyer will never be able to get that knowledge level, even if they spend six months doing diligence and turning your business upside down, which would be pretty aggravating. Um, they're still at a disadvantage. Uh, they don't know everything about uh, of the business. Um, so it's really just, again, a short-term insurance policy. Um, if you know something the seller told them turns out to not be true, um, or any surprises, a good a good example is a lawsuit. Um, you know, if if uh, a lawsuit pops up from three years ago, um, you know that's the, that's the seller's problem. Um, but the the buyer might have to settle that um, on, on behalf of the seller. So there has to be a little bit of of uh, you know money sitting aside. It's usually only for like six to twelve months, so it's not not uh, not forever. Um, and most sellers will get pretty much all or you know 95% or more of that hold back back. Um, it's very rare for there to be a claim or any material claim. Um, so it's just like a short term hold back, um, which is usually released within a year or less. Um, so yeah, if buyer and seller can agree on terms in the LOI and they get this far, um, the next uh, step is to kind of put the actual formal binding agreement in place. Um, so a, the buyer's lawyer will usually draft a a formal uh, asset purchase agreement uh, to use the asset sale um, as the next step. And we've seen these, they, they can be as short as seven or eight pages up to a hundred pages. I mean, depending on the size and complexity of, of the transaction, typically somewhere between 30 and 50 pages, most likely. Um, and it'll reflect the terms that were in the LOI. So all the kind of key and high level terms, um, plus a lot more, a lot of detailed legal language, legal terms. Um, so it's really important to have a really good lawyer uh, when you're going to, you know, do a sale process um, just for, for this, this part of the, of the, of the process, the, the legal, um, you know, knowledge becomes pretty in depth here. So you want a good lawyer, ideally with experience with similar transactions, uh, hopefully sale of a business transaction, but at least, you know, commercial real estate transaction uh, at the very least. So, um, 
again, we won't get into all the details of an asset purchase agreement. You know, there's way too much to cover there. That's a topic on its own. And, um, you know, our, our colleague, John Michael Tamburo, wrote an article about this. And then there's also a podcast we did recently about it. So check that out if you want to dig into the details there. But the the typical timeline to get an agreement in place really depends. It can be anywhere from two up to four weeks we've even seen. Um, if there's a lot of complexity, uh, maybe lawyers are a bit slow or vacation or whatever. So it, it can you know take up to a month to actually get that in place. Um, so you want to have good lawyers that can do it quickly. Um, and hopefully, if you you know got all all this way, agreements been drafted, signed, put in place at that point, uh, usually trigger the due diligence period. Um, so upon signing, that's when the buyer will will start its diligence. I think as Landon mentioned a few minutes ago, usually about forty five to sixty days that takes, um, and it. Basically, it involves a, a very detailed review of the business in depth by the buyer, even more than they've done kind of to date in the process, um, and a pretty pretty detailed and intensive information exchange. Um, so a large, large buyer list. Um, so uh, I guess, Landon, what, are, what can a seller expect in terms of the information they're going to have to provide at this stage? Uh, I guess just some examples, because there are, you know, numerous numerous items that will be requested yeah. one of the most something like common i guess and i'd say yeah it's so there's usually i would say anywhere from 12 to 15 <clears throat> kind of items that buyers request and this can be a lot for <clears throat> just to send jamble to a seller so we we me and colin usually put together like a diligence checklist so we have in a data room shared with both parties kind of an excel sheet with the schedule of everything mapped out so we can see what's been what's been sent, what's been completed, what still needs to be sent over. And this can include anything from side items such as like surveys or property condition reports, environmentals, um, certificates of occupancy, like just to name a few. Then there's some financial information. <clears throat> so previous tax returns, maybe employee payroll benefits, kind of that um, insurance policies, another one. Um, p l statements and then there's some other like additional items such as like outstanding gift card balances we've seen that one come up a lot um, in-depth membership counts and like a previous capex schedule just various things and it kind of depends on a uh, deal by deal basis on what really is needed and what's what those i would say are the most common that pop up more than more than others and we'll have yeah. that all detailed out an Excel spreadsheet and kind of keep track of everything needed, what we have and what we get so we can stay on top of things. Cause it's kind of easy to maybe misplace one or so we just have it all organized. So it's, it's easier for both parties to kind of see what's still needed and what we have. And I don't know, I just feel like it makes it overall easier. Yeah. And agree, pretty much every agreement you have with any vendor or supplier you have to provide like, uh, you yeah. know, like like your landscaping contract, but of course with chemicals and anything else, uh, any contract you have that ties the business to, even if it's cancelable at any time, that ties the business to making some purchases or, or from some company, you have to provide that, you know, every monthly utility bill for maybe a year or two, uh, bank statements for at least a year. Um, so it gets pretty, pretty granular. And uh, this is probably the most time consuming part of the process for a, a seller, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. And, and Landon mentioned a few things that also during the diligence period, um, you know, there's uh, not just information that has to be provided, but there's usually several site visits that have to happen. Um, typically because, you know, there's real estate and fixed assets involved and usually a bank, the buyer is a bank or a lender. Um, so there's some some documents and some site visits that have to be provided. Um uh, I don't know, Landon, you want to rattle off a few of those? Uh, I think you mentioned a few of them, but um, yeah, like the the surveyor, they're probably going to have to come for a couple Inspections, hours. Inspections, there's, yeah. I mean, it just, there's probably like three or four at least times where the site has to be visited just for in, different yeah. inspections. And maybe the buyer goes and visits a few times, check out the equipment and whatnot, seeing what needs to be replaced, if any CapEx is needed, just kind of getting all the last minute kind of final final their ducks in a row before yeah moving forward yeah so I mean, a seller should expect probably at least three three to four site visits um either by the buyer themselves 
uh, or, you know, again, a surveyor, an inspector, environmental assessment has to be done usually for a bank. Um, so they're just going to poke around for maybe an hour or two visually, um, stuff like that. And this is probably one of the parts of the process that give a seller the most anxiety and, and, and stress. People walking on their site, uh, usually because the employees, um, obviously that's not normal. Um, so something has to be kind of said to the employees. The sellers usually, you know, um, you know, it gets stressful because they don't want their employees to find out yet until it's a done deal. Um, so there's usually some angst about that. Um, there's ways you can get around it. Um, the most common we like to use uh, in terms of a backstory is, you know, the seller can tell his employees that they are doing a refinance with their bank or new bank uh, for their mortgage or their their debt they have on the property, um, which is usually a good excuse. And employees will understand that, OK, the surveyor is coming because the bank needs this because he's, you know, refinancing his mortgage. So that's usually a good way to kind of um, put a put a backstory in place for your employees. And it usually works. We've pretty much seen in, in, in almost all cases that there's never any issues with the employees. Um, mm -hmm. So that whole diligence period, um, again, is 45 to 60 days. It can be longer, especially, you know, if it's a 20 site, 30 site chain. Could be 90, 120 days uh, just for the, the volume of, of stuff that has to get done, to put it simply. Um, one thing I do want to mention here is these this sequence we've outlined is uh, what I call the commercial real estate sequence or process um, where it's offer and then put a purchase agreement in place. And then once that's on the diligence starts, there's also what I call the private equity way, um, which is normal and common. Um, and it's basically once an LOI is in place, the diligence period will start right then. And once they're maybe two or three weeks into the diligence period, they'll start drafting or have drafted a, that first um, draft of the purchase agreement. So basically diligence and the agreement get done um, at the same time, um, which can actually save save a, a bit of time. Um, but it's just the way private equity companies work, most of them. Um, so outside of car washes, mm -hmm. outside of real estate, that's actually probably the, the most common way. Um, 80 to 90 percent of the time, that's how it's done. Um, so if that does happen to to a seller, that just know that that is normal. And there are some big car wash companies that still do that. Um, the ones that are uh, private equity backed, some of them still operate that way, which again, completely normal. And there's there's pros and cons to to each kind of uh, process type. Um, and then I guess if you've gone through all of this, you're kind of got through diligence. Um, you know, the buyer still, there's been no deal killers that have come up. We have a podcast on that too. Check it out. Um, if nothing's come up, the buyer still wants to move forward with the 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 closing and the purchase of the, of the car wash. Um, there will be at that point a closing period. Um, and at this point, it's usually a binding sale. Um, so the, the buyer is locked in subject to various final loose ends being tied up and uh, kind of boxes checked. Um, and this this period, it's about 15 to, well, usually 30 days. Sometimes if a buyer knows what they're doing, it can be a little bit less, so maybe 15 to 30 days. Uh, it involves pretty much all the, all the practical items left to prepare the actual business changing hands from one buyer to another. So, um, you know, employees being put onto a new payroll system so they can get paid, you know, the week after uh, the closing, um, switching, over to a new POS system or the, you know, the buyer setting up their own account with DRB or ACS or Sunnies. Um, so they can actually, you know, operate the business the day after closing, um, getting their insurance in place. The seller will have to talk to the bank and actually get a, a debt payoff letter, which um, is basically um, assures the buyer that the debt's going to be paid off in what amount. Um, and lots of other paperwork, deeds, bills of sale, non-competes, all, all kinds of other stuff. Um, just to actually consummate the transaction, make sure everything's set up for the business to keep running the day after closing the way it did the day before closing. Um, uh, it's usually pretty seamless, hopefully. Um, again, it is pretty quick, two to four weeks usually. Um, everyone's kind of charging to get the deal done at that point. Um, so I guess to summarize that, overall, that's about four to six months is the whole process beginning to end. You should probably budget um, if you're going to get into a sale process. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty high level. We didn't want to get too in the weeds with any any parts of that. Um, so it's probably a good good place to end, uh, conclude this, this episode. Yeah. Um, hopefully 
um, listeners and watchers, uh, viewers found it helpful. Um, if anyone wants to kind of continue the conversation with Landon or I, maybe get it more in the weeds on any any part of that process or the whole process, um, feel free to, to get in touch with us with any questions. Um, you can reach out, we're available anytime, so reach out. You can go through um, you know, our website. Uh, we have a, a main number you can call in. Uh, get in touch with us that way. There is a person that will answer that phone. Shout out Tony. Mm -hmm. We do have an actual person answering. Uh, she'll get you in, uh, in touch with us. Uh, or if you want to reach out direct, um, my email is colin at carwashadvisory.com, C-O-L-I-N, Landon's L-A-N-D-O-N at carwashadvisory.com. Reach out to us by email if you want to you want to chat, set up a call. Um, I guess other than that, unless you have anything, Landon, I guess keep sending us uh, feedback and, and topics to discuss. And thanks for listening. Thank you all.